going to start then with our introductory um, explanation about this. So, so welcome to uh, One Chancery Lane's uh, webinar today on gas safety certificates and Section 21 notices um, with Richard Cherry and myself, Zachary Bredemir. Um, Richard's going to be talking about gas safety certificates and in particular the case of Jocerol, um and Rouncefield, the Court of Appeals recent decision, which um, we've all been waiting for, certainly since um, the uh, regulations uh, which we're just going to be telling about came into force to know what the, the courts would make of them. Um, there's a Q&A um, button to press. If you ask questions, then we will try and answer the, 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 any questions that you've got. Um, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A or, or comments in the chat. Um, then when Richard's finished speaking, I will talk a little bit about statutory interpretation. Um, and we hope to um, have sort of a time for Q&A um, at the very end as well. So um, I'm going to hand over to Richard in a second. What I should say about Richard um, is that he's been in Chambers for one and a half years and every time I've had a conversation with Richard in uh, about one and a half years about gas safe certificates, um, I have thought that I had to grip on it and then suddenly I realised that there is one more detail, one more twist uh, to the conundrum that I haven't mastered but Richard is completely on top of. So you'll know that Richard um, appeared for the, um, the respondent in the Tresserol case, and he is the man to know uh, to tell us all about it. So over to you, Richard. Thanks, Zach. Um, <laughs> I, th I think knowing everything about gas safety certificates is something that nobody can claim to, uh, to do at the moment, and I certainly don't. Um, Tracowell House and, and Ransfield has been uh, the latest, but possibly not the last chapter in a very long story, which has its origins deep in the mists of time or possibly in 1998, uh, when the uh, Tony Blair government enacted a piece of uh, health and safety legislation. It is, uh, as, as you may come to see, what I would describe and other people have described in, in various ways, and most of them are unfavorable, uh, as a, a classic case study of what happens when somebody takes two tangentially connected bits of legislation and decides to tie them together with a bit of string, um, which doesn't always work brilliantly. Um, there have been a lot of people involved in the case, and um, some of the names are seen, but uh, right back from the start, um, Richard Westlake at Cartridge's uh, law firm down in the southwest where they started, they took on the first appeal for um, Ms. Ransfield uh, until uh, the legal aid agency had a, an issue, and I ended up acting directly instructed on that appeal. Um, the opponents that I've had, Matthew Cannings, who was also the counsellor in Caradon and Schultz, which is an earlier case, which uh, I'll be talking about before, um, his honour Judge Luba QC, uh, and also represented the landlord on the first appeal before his honour Judge Carr, and Justin Bates and, and Brookline, who of course were instructed by Anthony Gold uh, against us in the Court of Appeal. Uh, I have to say that all my opponents in this case have been an absolute model of professionalism and courtesy. Uh, it has been a pleasure to be against them. They fought very hard for their clients. Um, I have had very kind help from um, Tim Baldwin um, of Golden Court, who was also involved in the beautifully named Ooh, uh, which we'll get a mention, um, and Ed Bishop QC and Andrew Warner QC here at One Chancery Lane, who have um, given me the benefit of their vast knowledge with great kindness as ever. Um, Arfan Bhatti, who's, who's here today, and Billy Clark and at Oliver Fisher took up the case in, in the Court of Appeal uh, without the guarantee of legal aid funding uh, and they were completely brilliant and um, sometimes the parties get forgotten. Patricia Ransfield herself actually put the correct legislation in front of the DJ at first instance um, including the regulation 36 7 point which the district judge got wrong. Um, so having launched through all of that um, it was heard on the 29th of January in the Court of Appeal before uh, Lord Justices uh, Patton and Moylan and Lady Justice King, and there's the reference uh, for the neutral citation. We start back, as I say, in the midst of time with the gas safety installation and use regulations, uh, and Regulation 36 in particular, which uh, sets out the duties of landlords. Um, these regulations start by defining in rather tortuous terms what they mean. The two important um, definitions are relevant gas fitting, which uh, it's nice and long that bit. It's, it's largely boilers and, and pipes containing gas. And that's not the end of the story, but it, it's 
really what's relevant for today. Relevant premises down there at the bottom um, means premises or any part of premises occupied, whether exclusively or not, for residential purposes, i.e. flats, homes, such occupation being in consideration of money or money's worth under a lease or license, so it's rental property. That, of course, is what we're dealing with here. 36.2 sets out a general duty. I'm going to shoot through these. Um, the slides will be available later, uh, and uh, you'll not take it all in off the top of your heads unless you've looked at it a lot, as some people have. But um, 36.2, this is why they're, they're enacted. Every landlord shall ensure that there is maintained in a safe condition relevant gas fitting and who's serving it. And the purpose, so as to prevent the risk of injury to any purpose, any person in lawful occupation of relevant premises, it is to safeguard the health and safety of tenants. And we do need to keep that in mind because it gets lost a bit later on, I think. Um, how do they do this? Well, Regulation 36.3 says in A and B, what a land must, landlord must do when, which is basically carry out a check at intervals of not more than 12 months. And then by 36.3c down here at the bottom, ensure that a record in respect of any appliance or flu so checked, and those words are in yellow because we'll come back to them later, is made and retained. It used to be just for two years. It's now until there have been two further checks of the appliance. So basically it's two years. Um, and 36.3c then goes on to tell you what a landlord has to put in such a record nine things, when it was checked, who checked it, signature from that person, um, etc. The etc doesn't mean that any of them are subsidiary, they're all vital as we will see later. 36.5, uh, a more general duty than the one we're going to come to. Uh, the record referred to in paragraph 3c above or a copy thereof to be made available on requests and upon reasonable notice for the inspection of any person in lawful occupation of relevant premises. Not necessarily your own tenant, it's a slightly wider duty, but the duty of a landlord to their own tenant is in 36.6. And it sets out two classes of tenant to whom a different duty is owed. It's notwithstanding paragraph 5, that a landlord has to by 6a ensure that a copy of the record may pursue into the requirements of paragraph 3c above, so having those nine pieces of information, is given to each existing tenant within 28 days of the check. So a landlord has to make his annual check, give it to the current tenant as the tenancy goes along. And then, uh, oddly enough, later in B, an earlier obligation, copy of the last record made in respect of the appliance of flu has to be given to any new tenant uh, and later the new tenant becomes known by, by virtue of his honour Judge Luber's judgment as a prospective tenant. Uh, has to be given to any new tenant of premises to which the record relates before that tenant occupies those premises. That bit becomes critical. Um, and then a less important bit for our case, in respect of a tenant whose right to occupy is not more than 28 days, a copy of the record may instead be prominently displayed. I, I, I'd say defocus on that because that may become a red herring in a moment. So 6, 36, 6a, duty to the current existing tenant, which I think <laughs> is repeatable annually. It may or may not be, and we'll see why. Uh, and 36, 6b, the one-off duty to give a new tenant or a prospective tenant the last record made and to give that before the tenant occupies. Well, that's where the fighting ground took place. Ironically, in our case, there is no 36.6 duty because there is no relevant gas appliance in any room occupied or to be occupied by the tenant, but that is covered by 36.7. 36.7 is quite long. I won't go through it, but what it does is create exactly the same duty on a landlord when there is gas in the premises but not in the tenant's demise. Here our boiler uh, for Carroll House was uh, in a, an outhouse effectively by the property, not in any part of the property as occupied by the tenant. But you have to do the same things except that you can, rather than giving, you can display 
But what you've got to display is exactly the same thing in a prominent position in the premises, that first yellow bit. And when you have to do it is from such time as a copy would have been required to have been given to the tenant. So at the same time as 6A and 6B require you to give, 7 requires you to display all you can give. And what you display is a copy of the record, but you have to endorse it that the tenant is entitled to have his own copy of the record on request to the landlord. And then if you get such a request as landlord, you have to give to the tenant a copy of the record as soon as is practicable. That again will, will, will be relevant and, and you'll see why. It, it's not just to display. The tenant has to have a right to have a copy of that if they ask for it. So what do they do? Well, in the domestic context, which is what Regulation 36 covers, they impose an annual regime of safety checks, that's by 36.3. They say what you have to check if you're a landlord, by whom a, a proper gas fitter, uh, gas safe registered these days, and when annually. They say what records must be made, because there's a check and then there's a record of that check and the difference is important. The GSR would call it gas safety record. It must be made, it must be kept for two years, there or thereabouts, and given at certain times to certain classes of tenants. And what they do, they impose a criminal sanction for the breach. Uh, and obviously, if there's a criminal sanction, nobody is going to uh, breach. So everybody lived happily ever after. Thank you very much. We can all go home. That's the end of my talk, sort of. Enforcement is down to the health and safety executive. And you may have noticed in my list of little credits of people involved, the HSC haven't been involved at any stage. That, that's not a criticism, it's just a comment. Um, between 2013 and 2018, RIDOR, uh, the reporting mechanism for uh, dangers, uh, had between, in, in each one year period between 2018, 2013 and 2018, they had between 1086 and 1674 notifications of dangerous gas fittings in rented accommodation only, just rented, they have separate figures for all accommodations, it's just rentals, between a thousand and not quite 1700. In those same periods, annually, each year, there were between 129 and 211 flammable gas incidents resulting in injury. Flammable gas, don't be misled by that, that's not necessarily explosions, far more is um, carbon monoxide poisoning. Those incidents caused between 193 and 356 non-fatal injuries in each annual period and the deaths in each year were between none in one happy year and eight at most. In the period between 2000 and April 2016 and March 2017 down here at the bottom there were 11 prosecutions, 11 for breaches of regulation 36 given the uh, number of dangerous gas fittings reported up there, which is between one and 2,000, given the incidents resulting in injury being in the hundreds, uh, the phrase disparity of protection, which we will hear later on, comes into its own. Uh, you will have your own conclusions about that. So, um, I started with a Star Wars quote. i continue with one. Uh, to misquote Princess Leia, help me, section 21, you're my only hope. What did Parliament decide to do? Well, they decided to enact section 21, capital A of the 88 Act, uh, which was inserted by section 38 of the Deregulation Act in 2015. And it says you can't give a notice under subsection 1 or 4 of section 21 at a time when, the underlying, underlying bit, those words will be teased over later. The landlord is in breach of prescribed requirement. 21A2, what are your prescribed requirements? Well, the ones that may be prescribed include at B, requirements imposed on landlords by any enactment and which relate to the health and safety of occupiers of dwelling houses. Well, guess what those are going to be, having looked at the 1998 gas regs. The beautifully poetically named Assured, short, old, tenancy notices and prescribed requirements, England regulations 2015, <gasps> deep breath, 2015 regs. Regulation 2 says 
2.1, subject to paragraph 2, the requirements prescribed for the purposes of section 21A of the Act are the requirements contained in A, we don't care about because it's not relevant to this, paragraph 6 or 7 of regulation 36 of the gas safety regs, requirement to provide tenant with a gas safety certificate, all fine and dandy. So we know that the prescribed requirements that you can't serve a section 21 notice if you're in breach of them are 36.6 and 36.7. But as His Honour Judge Lubeck QC noted, if it hadn't been for 2.2, we might all be a lot easier in our beds. 2.2 is the Anakin Skywalker of our piece. Uh, starts out all fine and dandy, but by the end has caused an awful lot of trouble and blown up planets. Well, possibly not the planet. For the purposes of Section 21A of the Act, the requirement prescribed by paragraph 1B above, that you've got to comply with 36.6, is limited to the requirement on a landlord to give a copy of the relevant record to the tenant and the 28-day period for compliance with that requirement does not apply. Now that has been the battleground in terms of whether a landlord needs to serve a record before the tenancy begins or not. Just to remind ourselves of 36.6, that's the uh, requirement in 36.6a is the specific reference to provide a record within 28 days of the date of the check. But in B, the new tenant uh, part, there is no such record, no such requirement to provide anything within 28 days. Again, the, the bit at the end, uh, the 28 day reference is a red herring because that's not about uh, supplying something within 28 days. So, that regulation 2.2 of the 2015 regs definitely limits the uh, requirement in 366A to provide a record within 28 days of the date of the check, but does it do anything to 366B? Um, the lead up to Tricarol House was um, the case of Assured Property Services Limited and E, which uh, was before District Judge Leatham as he then was in Edmonton, um, and carried on properties in Schultz. Uh, which started in front of District Judge Bloom, as she then was, so both of them have now become circuit judges, interestingly, um, who read 2-2 not to apply to 366B, and this was upheld on appeal to his Honour Judge Luba QC, and his judgment um, hangs, uh, depending on your point of view, like a um, Darth Vader's cloak or possibly a, a benevolent Obi-Wan Kenobi, and has very much set the terms of debate uh, both uh, for his honour judge Carr, who heard the first appeal in Carroll, and the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal make um, sustained reference to it, and with respect, quite right too, it's a, a very considered judgment by someone who, as many of you will know, was when he was at the bar, um, one of the landlord and, property, uh, landlord and tenant and, and housing uh, barristers of his generation, and is now um, Senior, senior civil judge at um, Central London County Court, and it really does repay careful reading. Uh, he came to the conclusion that uh, if you don't, as a landlord, give the last record made before the tenant begins to occupy, the literal words we say of um, 366B, you cannot rely on a Section 21 notice. Uh, His Honour looked at the purpose of 36, 6 and 7, which was to exist, they exist to ensure that not only the obligations on a landlord as to the checking or maintenance of gas appliances and food carried out, but that tenants and prospective tenants can have the assurance that they have been. In, in a sense, it, it mirrors the uh, Court of Appeals judgment of the purpose uh, of the uh, deposit protection regulations. Not only is the landlord to protect the deposit, but they must then give information to their tenants relating to that protection to give power to the tenant so that they can enforce the right that they have as to get the deposit back. And, and in that sense, I, I see that twin obligation uh, that's identified uh, as being a, a little bit parallel to that. So yes, it's checking for safety, but it's also allowing tenants and prospective tenants, and, and it was His Honour who came up with that uh, prospective word for new, which is in the legislation, to know what the position is. 
uh, that judgment identified the duties, the different duties owed to existing and prospective tenants and set up those two classes. It construed what uh, the judge said was the literal meaning of Regulation 2.2 in that it applied only to the 28-day requirement in 36.6a and it looked to the purpose of reading uh, which was the same and at 40 uh, he says it might well be thought that the requirement to give such a notice to a prospective tenant was fundamental to the achievement of gas safety in the private rented sector because it requires prospective landlords to check premises before letting them rather than simply leaving it to afterwards. So at the fact of our case in Tricarol and Ransfield, as I said, there was gas at the property, but not in the flat itself. So actually it's a 36.7 case, not a 36.6. But uh, as the obligations are identical, save as to display or giving the property, they are treated in the same way. And it was 36.6 that the court and field was actually construing. Tenancy commenced 20th of February, 2017. There was a gas safety record dated the 31st of January that year. That was the last record before, before the start of the tenancy. It was not given to the tenant until November 2017, so after she began to occupy, but it was before service of the Section 21 notice. And 36.7 didn't actually um, make a difference because it was never displayed. It was common, but it was never displayed. What also became an issue at the Court of Appeal appeal, which hadn't been raised below, was the next gas safety record was dated the 3rd of April 2018. Uh, as we went through the Court of Appeal, a further gas safety record emerged, um, which was dated the 2nd of February, but both were more than 12 months after the previous check. Uh, it was common that the 3rd of April one was given before service of the Section 21 notice. It was said by the landlord that the February one was given still in dispute and that's one of the reasons going to a county court but that then engages both 366a the duty to the existing tenant and 363 which defines that duty so at first instance the deputy district judge said no the 1998 regs aren't engaged because there's no gas in the flat and if i'm wrong about that i read 2 of the 2015 regs as disapplying a time element in 366b as well not just a so I'm making possession order. That was appealed to the circuit judge. It's on a judge car. Um, he said the district judge was wrong on the first point because 367 is engaged, and, and I think that's accepted. Uh, he read regulation 2 2 and, and drew on um, his honor Judge Luber's judgment. Uh, and with Judge Luber, he said that that is applied only the 28 day requirement in regulation 366 a and therefore because if the last record hadn't been given before occupation, the um, Section 21 notice could not be relied upon and the tenant's appeal was allowed. So that left us with the two questions in, in the Court of Appeal. First one, which is the, what the Court of Appeal said was the main question, does failure to give a tenant a copy of the gas safety record before the tenant begins to occupy, does that preclude the landlord from requiring, relying on a Section 21 notice? And then the second question, can a landlord comply with the requirement in 366A to give the existing tenant a copy of the record made pursuant to the requirements of paragraph 3C, and that's what the, um, the legislation says, by giving a record of a check that's actually been made outside that 12 month time frame that is stipulated by 363A. It's important that the time frame is in 3A and the, uh, the requirements of the record itself what it must contain are in 3C. So um, with respect to the Court of Appeal, we may have had one and a half answers. The first question, uh, the 366B point, the majority said, no, they disagree with uh, Judges Louvre and, and Carr. You can remedy as a landlord, the failure to give a section 21, sorry, the failure to give the last GSR before the tenant begins to occupy by giving it at any time up to serving a 20, Section 21 notice. Lord Justice Moylan disagreed. He held with the earlier decisions. No, that is irremediable. Um, on the second question, only um, Lord Justice Patton really dealt with it, and he disagreed with our line that the annual requirement uh, in 36.3c is imported into 36.3a, and 
therefore a landlord who gives a gas safety record of a check made at any time can therefore comply with 366A for his existing tenant. I'll, I'll look at exactly how that works a bit later because I, I think that is a big can of worms. Um, Lady Justice King was totally silent on that point. Uh, Lord Justice Moylan said he thought that um, he was probably of the same mind as Lord Justice Patton, but he wished to hear further argument. How exactly did the majority view um, come to their, uh, the majority come to their conclusion? Well, um, Lord Justice Patton sets out at six and seven, at six of his judgment, the um, paragraph in square brackets is the paragraph number in the judgment. Uh, the purpose of 36 and 7, they're clearly intended to ensure that a prospective tenant either receives or has access to a copy of the last record of inspection before taking up occupation. It's interesting that he specifically mentions that. And that each existing tenant is either furnished with or can see and obtain records of subsequent inspections carried out during the subsistence of his or her tenancy. Two, he said regulation 36.3 requires that Installations are checked for safety every 12 months, beginning no more than 12 months from the installation of the equipment, that's in A and B. But regulation 36.3 is not itself a prescribed requirement, uh, that is as uh, prescribed by the 2015 regulations, which only prescribe um, 36.6, although non-compliance is punishable as a criminal offence. The third thing, section 21 a and the 2015 regulations place additional pressure upon and provide encouragement for landlords to comply with the regulation 36 code of inspection by removing his ability to terminate the tenancy under section 21 note. And at 14, he cited, um, it was on a Judge Luber 3940 of Caragon, where Judge Luber said any other interpretation of the regulations would leave it open to a landlord to give a section 21 notice even where that landlord has let what may at the time have been a dangerous and unchecked premises. So they set out very similar frameworks uh, in all the judgments. How do they get to a different answer from uh, their honours, Lube and Carr? They looked at the, that were those words at a time when in section 21 capital A, at a time when a landlord is in breach of a, a prescribed requirement. Does that mean that as, as um, the argument put very strongly for the uh, landlord that at a time when means any failure must be capable of remedy. Uh, they looked around, they said possibly, but no clear answer. What, what doesn't come out very strongly from the judgment is that they sent counsel away to make a complete list of all the limitations on section 21 possession. Uh, they, they took the, that list in different ways. The majority said, that, oh, look, they're all remediable. Um, Lord Justice Moylan said, well, actually, no, um, the requirement to protect a, a deposit is not remediable in the sense that you can't ever do anything about it, save give the uh, deposit back. So he, he distinguished between those in a way that the majority view didn't. But they, they looked at the overall scheme, um, the limitations that have been placed on the um, the ability of a landlord to use Section 21, and they felt that the tenor of that scheme is such that every failure must be remediable. Uh, they did not agree that uh, there was a rather bold um, argument that Regulation 22 excluded the whole of Regulation 366B. They didn't go that far, but they did consider that it excluded the time element, and they had five issues about that. If failure to give a gas safety record before occupation prevents reliance on a Section 21 notice for all time, it gives the tenancy the security of a full assured tenancy, which was not what it granted, which is a um, classic uh, land lawyer's uh, argument, and, and quite properly with great respect. Uh, if you granted something, then both parties should be entitled to rely on what was granted. My, my answer to that is that uh, it actually is what was granted because the Section 21 procedure is a discrete set of rules which govern recovery of possession if certain conditions are satisfied. It's entirely procedural. Limitations were placed on that over time, uh, deposit protection, etc., etc. And what is granted 
is a tenancy that is subject to all of those rules. So I, I respectfully disagree that the once and for all obligation to serve the last record before the tenancy, which is what um, Judge Luber set out, uh, I dispute that that is not what is granted. It's all part of that um, statutory overlay. And I know Zach is, is going to have a little look at that uh, and, and the two possible views of that. Um, two, they, they said, 6B is a prescribed requirement would then impose a far greater sanction than 6A, quite right. Um, it does, but my argument respectfully is that otherwise it's no sanction at all. Uh, an unsafe property is unsafe from day one and that's why you get a disparity of uh, protection. It is potentially about life and death without being over dramatic about it. We've seen that people die and are injured in, in far too great numbers. Um, why would there be uh, a disparity? Well, um, Zona Judge Carr identified the, uh, the difference between the two classes of tenants. They said it's not easy to see it three. Uh, it's not easy to see why there'd be greater protection intended for prospective tenants than existing ones. Well, a, a suggested answer by Zona Judge Carr was the different position of a new and, uh, and an existing tenant. Your prospective tenant knows nothing about the property or the landlord. In theory, if the existing tenant has had the benefit of that gas safety certificate before they became a tenant, they know that at the outset the property had been checked and was safe. Also, they know the date of the check and if there's then a requirement for an annual check, they are given a certain amount of power. I know it's not an equal power relationship between landlord and tenant, but they're given a certain amount of power when that next annual check becomes due to make that point to their landlord and to have that check carried out. And to have auto enforcement, if you like, by the parties, rather than uh, the HSC having to intervene, which as we know, they, they very rarely do, 11 times. Um, and it goes back to the, the twin objectives that is on a Judge Luba identified, that it be safe and that a tenant knows it is safe. And, and that's a possible uh, justification for that disparity of protection. It's more needed, if you like, for the prospective tenant than the, the existing one, because the existing tenant, when they were a prospective tenant, has already benefited from that. So they're not they're not different people. The prospective tenant becomes the existing tenant. They are the same people at different times. Um, at four, uh, section twenty one a is not the primary sanction for non compliance. It's only collateral to the uh, the criminal sanctions and at best a spur to compliance. Uh, my answer to that is, well, section 21A was enacted precisely because the criminal sanction was not working. Um, it was the intention of Parliament to enact that, therefore it, it is perhaps a little dangerous to say, oh, it's, it's only secondary. Um, and five, a point I, I didn't quite get, many assured short alternatives are granted for fixed periods of one year or less, so that in practice the landlord's ability, inability to rely on section 21 will provide a strong incentive for the timely comp compliance with paragraph 6b. Well, it, timely in the sense of in that period, in that uh, scenario within a year, but not before occupation. Uh, and just as there are um, ASTs that, that persist for a year, um, equally there are many that persist for a number of years. We all know that as, as, as landlord and tenant lawyers. So I, I not sure it's entirely in, in tune with the real world at that point in, in, in my uh, respectful submission. So uh, at 29 and 30 of, of his judgment, Lord Justice Patton reaches his conclusion that the, um, the reading that we uh, contended for seems an unlikely result for Parliament to have intended, which is in possibly slightly posher language, just what District Judge, um, Deputy District Judge Rutherford uh, came up with in the first instance. The correct source of the remediable nature of the breach. So why I say 2-2 two, two, uh, means what, what it means uh, is, in my view, regulation 2-2. Two, two. And if that is right, then section 21A1 can be given its ordinary and obvious meaning. Well, perhaps not obvious, given that everybody's been arguing about it so much, but there we are in relation to the limited prescribed requirement, which is uplifted from paragraph 6b by regulation 2.2. So saying that uh, you construe 21a in the light of 2.2, and that therefore must limit uh, 
366b as to time just as 366a. As a matter of construction, he concludes, I therefore prefer, prefer the view that as a result of regulation 2.2, the time when the landlord is in breach, that's my emphasis, of paragraph 6b ends for the purposes of section 21a once the gas safety record is provided. So at a time when the landlord is in breach is only until uh, they provide that, uh, that gas safety record. And therefore, if they do it, at any point before the Section 21A, uh, Section 21 notice, they are not any longer in breach. Uh, and he informs us that the point is not straightforward. Well, I agree. Um, the dissenting view from Lord Justice Moylan, uh, he says that there are a lot of ASTs. He says the gas safety checks are very important and uh, laments that, as we've seen, combined effective regulation in uh, 36 and regulation 2.2 is not as clear as it might be. But it goes back to the reason for enacting Section 21A, the safety of occupiers of the dwelling houses, and therefore his belief that the legislation might be expected to impose a substantive sanction rather than simply a procedural requirement to give a GSR to a tenant at any time prior to the provision of Section 21 notice. So he says that late compliance is mere procedural, but uh, compliance before the beginning of the tenancy requires a substantive sanction, i.e. you lose your right to rely on a Section 21 notice. He accepts that there's this disparity of treatment, which I, I talked about, but he considers, without going into detail, that there may be reasons to justify it. But what he comes down to is that no reasons have been identified, either by reference to principles of statutory interpretation or otherwise, why what I regard to be the effect of Regulation 2.2 on a plain reading should not be applied. And he says that that plain reading is clear because 2.2 makes express reference to the 28-day requirement, which is only in 6a, not in 6b. It uses the word and between uh, and the 28-day uh, requirement does not apply. And then the absence of the words which the drafter could have put in before the tenant occupies, if the drafter had wished it to be obvious that 2.2 applied to the 366B, could have used the words before the tenant occupies, which are of course the words from 366B. And he finishes, if the time requirements in both paragraphs 6A and 6B were lifted, then I do not see these provisions as imposing much of a now, the second question, 36.3, received much less attention and time. Uh, Lord Justice Patton set out that paragraph 36.3a is not a prescribed requirement uh, within uh, the 2015 regulations. It's only 36.6. Reading the words so checked in paragraph 3c, as the respondent contends, I contended that the words so checked in 3c must refer back to the 3a and 3b requirements to make the check annually because they can't refer to anything else in my submission. Uh, uh, it would mean a landlord has no obligation under paragraph 3c to make and retain a copy of any late inspection nor would regulation 36.5 be workable and that seems absurd. Um, I, I don't see that having no obligation under paragraph 3c to make and retain the copy of a late inspection it is actually there because as, as Lord Justice Patton clearly set out, there's the criminal the criminal sanction, which is for any breach of the regulations themselves. And then there's the Section 21 related sanction, which is only for the breach of the prescribed requirements. Uh, and and as, as he says, the three the three C requirements are part of the prescribed requirements because uh, 36.6 refers to that, but the 3A requirement is not part of those prescribed requirements in his view because there is no direct reference in 36.6. Uh, and he said the words so checked in paragraph C refer back to the phrase checked for safety in paragraph 3A, not the annual check, but any check, and they cover every safety check which is carried out. Well, respectfully, I don't see that that uh, gets a landlord off the hook if every 
safety check is covered by the word so check, then it simply means that the landlord has to give a record of every check. If it doesn't absolve them from uh, one obligation, it merely adds an obligation. So I, I respectfully differ from the justice on that point. So he says that the, the obligation imposed on the landlord by paragraph 6a is simply to give the existing tenants a copy of a gas safety record which contains all the information specified in paragraph 3c. And, and he found that the April check in our case, which did not, because the landlord then said that the check had actually been carried out in February, it therefore did not carry the date of the check. It therefore did not comply with 3c and he said that that could not as a matter of law, be uh, oh, serving that could not comply with the 6a requirements. So we do know the Court of Appeal has said that if the three, the nine uh, matters in 3c are not included in a gas safety record, serving that will not comply with 6a or indeed 6b. Uh, but it does not need to be a gas safety record which relates to check carried out in accordance with the 12 month requirement in 36.3a. I, I say that is important and part of the reason we know it's important is the new regulation 36a, capital A, which uh, put in a, a quasi MOT provision and allows two months leeway. You can get your check done as a landlord two months early. So say it's due in, in January, you can do it any time in the two months preceding that and you preserve your anniversary so that you don't have to do your next one two months early so that a prudent landlord would end up doing checks more than uh, they need to. So it's a sensible um, provision giving a landlord a bit of flexibility that they can get their check done nice and early, not run the risk of having a late gas safety record uh, and still preserve the anniversary. And that for me says the timing of the annual check is actually very important. Um, it leaves us with what I think might be, well, what are definitely unanswered questions and many people have written about that and possibly unintended consequences. My first one, uh, 36.6b means a landlord has to give a copy of the last record made for the safety check. Well, if the requirement of an annual check isn't part of those prescribed requirements, when must that last record have been made in order to rely on a section 21 notice does it have to be as we have i think most um of the uh the legal professionals working in the area have assumed that it must be within 12 months before the start of the tenancy if there isn't a prescribed requirement that the checks be annual for the purposes of section 21 well could it have been made some years before it's, it's possibly an open question. It might be a brave uh, council who advances that on behalf of the landlord, because of course it means the landlord has broken the law and is subject to a criminal sanction. But it, it, it may, uh, you know, it, it, it's an interesting matter. Um, two, the 36, three point goes further. Uh, so a landlord can comply with 36, 6A by giving record of a check uh, that contains the information, the nine points of information in, in 3C, but they can, that is irrespective of when the check was made. So let me ask you about two scenarios. You've got a tenancy that persists for five years. There are no checks carried out during the tenancy until a check is performed two days before, and the record of that given one day before serving a 21, section 21 notice. Is that section 21 notice valid? There has been uh, compliance with 366A because the uh, record has been given. It doesn't matter that it's not been carried out in, in compliance with the 12 month regime. And uh, is your section 21 notice valid then? The other end of the tenancy, there's a check carried out in the first month of the tenancy. No further checks performed. Tenancy continues five years again. That's the check. The record the GSL that's given to the tenant before service of the 20, section 21 notice is your section 21 notice valid then? Quite possibly, uh, given what the uh, Court of Appeal has said about it being a prescribed requirement for that checks to be 12 monthly, so that a few worms have crept out of the can. Um, that's my uh, 
bit. I'm just looking. There's a. There's a. Oh right, there's a question. Yeah, Can Richard, you've um. Th thanks very much for that. There's 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 an unanswered question, and Judy's yeah. got her hand up. There's another yeah. two questions as well. So right. I'll I'll say something about the two questions that um haven't uh that, that I've slightly answered. Okay. Well, 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 you get to grips with the question that I haven't answered. So, so that's so, the open question from Gary that I'm looking at. Yeah, so, so, so Patrick Richard asked an intriguing question about whether 36, Regulation 36 doesn't apply at all when there's no gas facility in the building. And you, I think, Richard, you've got an interesting case about this, haven't you? Because you've got something where the gas facility is in the boiler room, not in the building the flat's located. And so whilst Patrick's question um, suggests the obvious answer that if a gas facility is not in the building, potentially... When you look at the definition of relevant gas fitting and relevant premises in Regulation 36, you've still got this query about whether you've got a gas facility where the landlord might have some interest in going to the boiler room, but an easement or something like that. It may still be yeah. a gas facility within the within the meaning of regulation. So, so Patrick's rather good question um, is, is a bit more complicated than it appears. The answer to that is in the definitions uh, relevant gas fitting, I've put the screen up, uh, 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 it's 36.1. Um, a relevant gas fitting is any gas appliance, blah, 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 in any relevant premises, and any gas appliance or installation pipe work which directly or indirectly serves the relevant premises. So it's anything that is providing, let's say you've got a boiler off, slightly off site, providing hot water to a flat, so it is uh, directly serving the relevant premises. So to, to qualify, that then has to be B1, installed in any part of premises in which the landlord has an estate or interest. So um, the interesting question then becomes, if you have a, uh, if your landlord, you've got a tenant, you've got their landlord who is an intermediate landlord and they're the freeholder or some superior chain of, of land holding above that landlord and the boiler is in a piece uh, piece of land which is owned or controlled by the superior landlord does the direct landlord then get caught by the regulations um now i say the answer is in here i, I can't tell you what the, the answer is um, if it's definitely installed in any part of premises in which the landlord has an estate or interest, well, does that include if he has an easement? You'll sometimes have in leases, you'll have an easement over a communal boiler room so that they can send people in to, to repair it. Um, that's, we know an easement is not an estate in land, but it, it, I would say, pack anything Zach would come up with, it's an interest. Um, if they have an estate in that piece of land, whether whether it be uh, free or leasehold, well, that it's caught there. Um, and if it's owned by the landlord or is under his control, well, <laughs> you know, you can imagine an awful lot of fighting over not owned by but under control. Um, it's it's difficult, but that that's where you will find what gives you your answer rather than oh, what we've got a bit further than patrick where he's talking about a new build with no gas facilities at all and and there of course regulations won't apply at all so e equally they won't apply to your your property out where you are with no with no gas connection no if there's if there's no gas if there's no um new builds tend not to have gas at all do they um no gas anywhere no boiler yeah if if, if, if there's no gas that the regulations don't apply, don't apply. If there's, no, if there's no relevant gas fitting uh, or gas appliance of any sort, uh, regulations can't catch them. So, so um, a bit, there's a couple of other questions for you yeah. to have a look at. COVID. Um, hmm. so, so something I think Julian asked, which I think related to uh, practice direction 51Z, uh, really the question was, what do you do with a difficult tenant at present? Do you issue or, or, or what is it? And, and, and Julian and um, for anyone else, and I'll let Richard throw his comment in afterwards. My advice to my clients at the moment is, you know, issue, I mean, it obviously depends, but issue what you can, be it a claim for rent arrears or an injunction or whatever. Um, and as and when practice direction 51Z permits us to bring possession claims, you can amend, apply to amend to bring the possession claim at, at that point. 
Um, yeah. hey, Richard, do you want to take your um, to be able to questions or? Yeah, I, I, actually, I was just going to add on that because it, it may be a point of very general application that a lot of um, solicitors are having to um, worry about. Of course, what you've got to do, um, you can't do anything during the stay. You can you can serve a Section Twenty One notice or a Section Eight notice during the stay. Um, they're both they both have to have a three month validity now. Uh, or three month period for, for expiry. So they, they're both going to expire now after August the 23rd when the, the stay will end if, if not extended. So um, you're going to be able to get moving then anyway. So if, if, you, uh, if you have a landlord who's wondering about uh, giving a notice, I'd say go ahead and give a notice if, if everything's in place. Um, if there's a, a, a claim you can issue, as Zach said, and then uh, what I think most people are reading the stay as being is that 14 days from the end of the stay will then become the deadline for um, a defence. Uh, so if I can do what I was told to do, um, in respect of a landlord who fails to serve a certificate for a pre 1st of October 15 AST, oh I hate this bit, um, to enable the landlord to serve a valid section 21 notice, does the landlord have to serve the valid certificate that existed at the start of the AST or the one at 1st of October 2018? Um, uh, go and read Nearly Legal. Uh, there's a brilliant debate on that uh, and I have actually talked to um, Giles about it uh, and G Giles is brilliant on, on all this stuff. Um, We know that um, the statutory periodic tenancy uh, is a new tenancy because of super strike, the, the, the dreaded S word. Um, so if you are terminating that tenancy, the, uh, the, likely, the likelihood is that you have to serve the one that was um, valid at the start of, the, of that AST. But again, I, I, I go back to my final slide. Uh, who knows what what you have to serve um, for, to, to comply with 366B if there isn't actually an annual requirement into the prescribed requirements. But for safety, uh, within the 12 months before the start of the tenancy, um, I think it would be a very harsh court that would decide, and I, I'd be saying appeal it if, if it did, that having served the um, the GSR that was valid at the start of the tenancy, i.e. pre-October 15, if you haven't served uh, one at 1st of October 18, uh, that you're somehow prevented from relying on a Section 21 notice, uh, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be appealing that. So I think, yes, if you should be, take it with a pinch of salt, you should be safe having served the, um, the pre-October 15 one, or, or, or the one that uh, at the start of the tendency, rather than the later one. Um, Hugh's question, yes, the COVID-19, uh, well, Lord alone knows, Hugh. Um, there isn't, as it stands, any, uh, well, first of all, there doesn't, according to the Court of Appeal, there doesn't appear to be any uh, any negative implication on a landlord who fails to carry out a test within the 12 month period. If there were, or if let us say they were um, saying that COVID was a reason for not having a check before, carried out before the tenancy began, there's nothing, there's nothing in any legislation that says you have, a, you have a, an excuse. Uh, it, it's not particularly fair, but it, it doesn't, as, uh, as I've seen, it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any uh, let out for that, which seems unfair. Uh, it, it's, it's simply that a landlord has the opportunity to get into the premises in, in normal circumstances, whether they have to use a, um, an injunction to do so. And of course, you're not prevented from seeking an injunction by COVID. You may be prevented if, if your gas filter doesn't want to go, um, but there isn't, as I see it, any uh, allowance made for the COVID situation. Have you got any more unanswered? 
No, the, the, the only other question was, was Julie, but I think she might have, um, I was going to go and try and allow her to speak, but I think she might have left. Um, Julie had her hand up so long that we... Yeah, we, yeah. Um, so, so if you're still listening, Julie, if you're still listening sorry, and I, um, uh, I would try to give you a chance to talk. Now, um, Richard, I think what I'll do, because it's nearly, it's nearly midday, um, so okay. rather than rather than plunge into my slides on statutory interpretation, I think what I'll just do is summarize what I was going to say um, and, and potentially sort of allow people to sort of um, comment on, on um, ask other questions and comments. So um, my, my um, talk essentially was going to talk a little bit about statutory interpretation, what the courts do when it's interpreting statute and perhaps were sort of do do a full blown thing on another day because there's a lot more that I could have said um, on the topic, but but I think essentially the things I wanted to say uh, were uh, one, really what the courts are doing when they're interpreting statutes is they're not really doing anything differently um, from when they're construing any other type of written agreement. And when you look at the um, the way in which the the cases have arisen, if you look at things like the Golden Rule, which is regarded as a particular rule of statute interpretation, it isn't. It, it's a, it's a, it's a Will's case. And, and, and really the, the, the key to what the courts are doing is, is that they're just construing a document. The second thing um, I was going to discuss were just some of the similarities and differences between statutory interpretation and contractual interpretation. And the, the, the thing I think is, is a big difference and um, be interested to know what Richard thinks about this is, is that it, whereas in a contract, what the courts are trying to do is identify what the reasonable person having all the information for parties had would make of the words that are used. Um, in the case of statutory interpretation, what the court is doing is trying to impute the intention that Parliament had when using those words. And the key difference, I think, in the case of statutory interpretation rather contractual construction, is that the courts have a particular conception of Parliament and what Parliament is and what Parliament wants to do when they're construing statutes. And I think uh, a, a couple of things there, part of that conception is the courts recognize that parliament is fallible. So it recognizes that it needs to iron out the language in some cases. And uh, it also recognizes or, or assumes that parliament has delegated uh, to the courts uh, the ability to uh, correct the interpretation and um, we see them needing to do that in Tricarol. But the third thing I think about the court's conception of Parliament is um, the courts regard Parliament as being essentially libertarian, uh, which is potentially controversial, but you have presumptions about uh, no double taxation, uh, no penalties being imposed. So I think a lot of the rules and presumptions that we have about statutory interpretation ar arise from that particular conception um, about um, what, what Parliament is. Then I just wanted to say something about Richard, why I think your case is so difficult. Uh, and I, I think there's, there's two issues, but the one issue is, and it's something you've touched on already, is, is that you have this Regulation 2.2, which has clearly been poorly drafted. Um, regulation 36.6 clearly has two limbs, they're clearly in the alternative. Um, whereas Regulation 2.2 envisages that it's talking about one obligation um, by reference to the requirement and, um, and, 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 and that requirement. It clearly is talking in the singular. So there's clearly an error in the draftsman. The draftsman clearly has not recognised that Regulation 36.6 has, has these two limbs. And, and that's usually not a problem um, where you've got... Um, a, 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 an error in the drafting because usually the, the, the correction is obvious um, and but this this is a case Richard where as, as the court says there isn't really an obvious answer um, and the difficulty there is is, is is the obscurity of the policy Richard isn't it um, and the majority in the Court of Appeal are quite impressed by this point about um, the assured tenancy and the ability to terminate uh, the assured tenancy. And um, what I was going to say in relation to that is this idea that um, 
the policy behind Section 21, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult point because do you regard Section 21 and the ability to have a no fault ground possession, do you regard that as being the entitlement of the landlord? That this is what the landlord is entitled to do and that the, the restriction of the Section 21 regime is a, is, is a restriction. Um, now, Julian's saying he's lost sound. Hopefully, hopefully everyone else can hear me. Um, Richard, I'm sure, will let me know if he, he can't hear me. Um, do you regard Section 21 as being the entitlement of the landlord to, issue, to, 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 to get possession um, with a, a, a limitation of um, the, the period of full possession? Or do you regard Section 21 as being a privilege to landlords uh, in order to encourage them to bring properties onto the market to make available for rental accommodation? And, and in that context, um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that in, in my lifetime, there has only been a period of about 10 years where a, a landlord uh, has, a, um, has an entitlement to um, get possession uh, without proving any fault, without having to take steps prior to the commencement of the tenancy. So between 1996 and 2007 is the only period in my lifetime where, where that has been the case. And the, the policy of successive, successive parliaments has been to give tenants statutory protection. And from the Housing Act 1980 onwards, this is only the period where you begin to get these uh, ability of the, um, the ability of the landlord to bring possession claims where there is, where there is no fault. So the, the, the policy behind Section 21, I, I don't think is as, is as straightforward as the majority thinks. And, and then, of course, Richard, you've got the other problem in relation to the way that um, the gas safety certificate regulations work. You've got these three stages of the obligation. The fundamental obligation is to make the gas um, facility safe. Um, and uh, then, then you've got the obligation, how do you achieve that? You achieve it by having 12 monthly inspections. And how is the tenant to be kept informed about that? How is the enforcement mechanism to be effective? Part of that is the provision of information to the tenants. And it's only that element uh, which has been imported into Section 21. So you've got this difficult question under Regulation 2.2 as to the mischief that Regulation 2.2 is directed at. Is it directed at providing information, in which case one can see where the majority is coming from, or is it directed at making um, gas facilities um, safe for the tenants? And if you also have regard to the idea that the Section 21 no fault regime is to encourage landlords to bring properties to the market, you can say, well, the reason for the dichotomy between the existing tenants and the new tenants is that Section 21 is to encourage landlords to bring properties to the market. And what we don't want are new properties which are dangerous hence potentially the, the discrepancy between the, the two regimes. So, 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 so those were going to be my thoughts, or those are my thoughts on um, the statutory interpretation point. Um, and, 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 and why Dracarol, I think, is, is, is a very difficult case uh, for um, courts trying to construe what Regulation 2.2 really means. Richard, have we got any, any further questions? Yes. Um, we have further questions. I'll, I'll just address the question you asked me, Zach, um, on the policy um, point. Uh, I, th I think it's clear, or at least everybody appears to agree, that the political intention in enacting Section 21A, or the policy intention, was uh, to impose a limitation on the landlord's ability to use Section 21, and, and that was to promote the safety of residential occupier, rental occupiers. Um, the difficulty, as, as, as you went to, that, Zach, is that once you identify that, how you interpret the regulations that best fulfil the intention. Uh, and the landlord argument would be, well, if a check is carried out, that's good enough because the property is safe. The tenant would, would take, uh, it's on a Judge Luber's view, that it requires the giving of the record as well to, to put us in the position that we know it's safe and, and the sort of the flourish that I added to it that's perhaps going a bit far is that then they can um, insist on, on future checks being carried out. But, but it, it really is, as, as we've seen with different courts going different ways and it's completely open um, as to how you should interpret it 
in order to remedy the mischief and fulfill the, um, the intention. Uh, I've got some questions. Uh, Gary's, Gary's asked the nice easy one, is this going to be appealed? And uh, Ian has uh, asked that as well. Uh, permission is being sought to uh, appeal to uh, the Supreme Court. Um, I think it's, it's clear that it is a very wide application. Uh, it is a question that is all levels have said it's, it's difficult. I mean, uh, Lord Justice Patton said it's, it's not easy to say. Uh, as on Judge Lieber said the same. So the, the split decision as well is relevant. So it, it's um, we think it's absolutely right for the Supreme Court, but we would say that, wouldn't we? Um, I do think that the the 36-3 point is, is very important for the Supreme Court because that, that really could, um, if, if it doesn't require an annual series of inspection, that to me dismantles the entire um, point of, of having uh, any Section 21 mechanism to enforce compliance with uh, with those regulations. Um, Tim Baldwin has asked uh, the question, the regulations are secondary legislation and are produced by the departments. What was the oversight uh, by Parliament? Were these a positive or negative procedure and was there any debate or approval of them by Parliament? Um, I, I can't go to all the detail of that. The um, the way in which the secondary legislation um, came about was uh, the uh, was Section 38 uh, Dereg Act, which, um, which inserted Section 21A uh, as well. Um, the, and, and the 2015 regulations were made under that. That was by a Lord's Amendment that was put forward by Lord Ahmad, and, and the, who was the uh, under secretary in the Lords, uh, but, but uh, effectively acting as, as the appropriate minister. There was very limited debate. I've read the debate um, and it's, it's much, it's, it, it hardly touches on gas safety at all, which is interesting. Um, the uh, parliamentary materials were put before the Court of Appeal. Um, and again, they said, hard to say either way. Um, I put forward a couple of answers in 2019 um, by relevant ministers, which were word for word identical in the Lords and the uh, Commons, and um, they are they possibly lean towards the um, supporting the view that the failure to serve the gas safety record and comply with 366B is not remediable. But again, it, it's very vague that the, the process and it's 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 clear that this is important, uh, but what the process by which regulations were made um, has not been satisfactory in itself. And, and the answer is no, there was insufficient debate. But I do query whether even extended debate would have, would have worked out that they're not going to work. And it's only when you see, you get cases like this and see it's, it's fundamentally broken that, that we all realise it, it isn't working. It isn't working for landlords or tenants and they, they need a clear answer. So that's a bit of a witter, Tim. Um, thank you for the question. Um, uh, Richard, Suzanne's got her hand up. I'm going to try and allow her to talk to um, find out what her question is. So oh, here we go, Suzanne. Susan, you're, you're muted. Do you have a question for us? Do I need to unmute you? Um, right, I've unmuted this end. Hmm. Susan, do you want to yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe type your question in or unmute yourself? Uh, there's another question. Oh, so, so Tim just says many thanks. So, <laughs> so do we have any other, do we have any other questions or any other comments? Um, if not, then I think we need to tell you two things. Firstly, our webinar next week, as I mentioned earlier on, is going to be um, Andrew Spencer and Sarah Prager um, talking about um, vicarious liability and travel law. And Richard, you and I, we, we've said we're going to do this again, aren't we? Or we're going to do something again on dilapidation and disrepair in September. So um, over August and beginning of September, we're going to be running some back to basics seminars and Richard and I are going to be talking about dilapidations and uh, disrepair. So if you've got anything about dilapidations or disrepair, 
um, that you'd like us to talk about. And I imagine what we're going to talk about is what disrepair is, Section 11, and how you assess damages. I imagine we're going to talk about something like those, that maybe something about remedies, other remedies. But if you've got something you'd like us to talk about in September, I think it's the 3rd of September, then, then, then do let us know. So, um, other than that, thank you everybody. the question back from Heidi. Do you think we can... All right. Can I chuck that at you? Is there any yeah. way to appeal a previous decision which followed previous decisions made a couple of years ago, so technically out of time? So, um, Caradon and Schultz. No, we can't, can't appeal Caradon and Schultz. Is there any way to appeal a previous decision which followed a previous decision? So, I, I, I'm interpreting that as um, a, a, a claim has been dismissed for failure to serve the gas safety record before the tenancy began. Oh, I see. Uh, that is now not, that has now been uh, urged yeah. by the Court of Appeal. Go on, yeah. uh, you're, 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 I, 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 The fact the law has changed, you're not going to get any, any sympathy. Um, and the, um, I'm, I'm the example of that was the recent, uh, or perhaps not so recent decision about joint enterprise in the House in the Supreme Court when they changed the law about uh, joint enterprise and um, there would have been plenty of, of, sort of out of time appeals. You're, you're not going to get very much sympathy uh, for not having appealed at the time. Um, okay, so, so uh, Suzanne didn't have a question. So f f f thanks for letting us know, Suzanne. And um, so yes, uh, Stephanie would like Richard's email address. Stephanie, um, we will certainly- uh, so Screen Richard, now, both of our emails. There you go. You have, you have, So unless anyone's got anything else to add, um, Richard, do you want to, do you want to say anything to, to, to finish off? Just, just thank you very much for bearing, bearing with me through what was um, longer than I intended. It always is, um, and a very, very fraught area. Um, really, that, the, thing, the thing for people representing landlords is that as, as things stand, uh, depending on what happens at the Supreme Court, you, you can remedy everything now by getting all your ducks in a row before you serve your Section 21 notice. And that applies to uh, deposit protection issues, how to rent uh, booklets, uh, gas safety, all gas safety now, um, and EPC. So as long as you um, can get your clients to put all of that in order before the Section 21, you should be okay at the moment. But uh, whether courts will then say, oh, well, it might be going to the Supreme Court, we'll stay it, goodness only knows. I know there were a lot of cases that were stayed pending uh, pending this outcome. So there may be a while longer for people to wait, unfortunately. Super. Well, um, Richard, best of luck getting permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. We shall see. <laughs> okay, and uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody.